Hi there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Battle of Christophus was a difficult battle for the Grand Army of the Republic. They faced a massive Separatist Alliance droid force in an extremely densely populated urban environment packed with civilians who had not yet been evacuated. The landscape was dotted by skyscrapers, creating extremely dangerous vertical battlefields. During one engagement, Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi hide inside one of these skyscrapers and set up an ambush on an incoming Separatist column down below on the street level. Suddenly, droids burst in and ambush their own ambush and begin opening fire. The Republic clone troopers are forced to withdraw from this position and head for extraction. On their way out, one quick-thinking clone manages to rip off the head of a tactical command droid. They bring that head back for analysis and it's revealed that the Separatists knew exactly where their forces would be waiting. There's a mole within the Grand Army of the Republic on Christophus and his betrayal has led to clone trooper deaths. To make matters worse, Captain Rex and Commander Cody, the two clones put in charge of the investigation for the mole, realize that the culprit is a clone trooper named Sergeant Slick. Knowing what we know about clone troopers and their steadfast loyalty to the Republic and each other, it's extremely surprising that a clone could do this to his fellow soldiers. Today we're going to do a breakdown of Clone Sergeant Slick and try to understand his motivations and why he did what he did, and why so few other clones actually betrayed the Grand Army of the Republic. Clone Trooper Slick was a part of the first batch of clone troopers created by the Kaminoan cloners for the Grand Army of the Republic. He would achieve the rank of Clone Sergeant by the time of the Battle of Christophus and lead his own platoon into combat. Slick, like most of the first batch of clone troopers, had witnessed the horrors of the Battle of Geonosis, and like many, his first taste of real combat was extremely bitter and tough. We have to remember that the clone trooper was raised from birth to fight on battlefields, even with their rapid aging. That meant nine years of continuous non-stop drilling, training, and military theory classes, and preparation for this one moment when they enter the battlefield. Imagine training for something for nine years and never actually being able to do the thing you're training for, and then suddenly, after all of that excitement, you finally get to go into battle. The clones viewed the Battle of Geonosis with this same type of excitement, but the exhilaration of entering battle in order to test themselves faded away with the first volley of turbo laser fire. The problem wasn't the clones. They were terrific at taking orders, they were extremely brave, and they made the best out of their situation on the battlefield. Their Jedi commanders, however, were completely unprepared for the burdens of military leadership. First, most of them lacked any real battlefield experience. They had no training in tactics or strategy. They didn't understand the capabilities of the clone troopers and what tools and weapons they had at their disposal. Many of the Jedi commanders would meet their units in the middle of the battle with zero briefing or knowledge about them. The Jedi were also trained to not have attachments to other people, so it's quite common for the Jedi to justify dehumanizing the clone troopers as just mere assets on a battlefield. The Jedi have also always coasted along in combat situations. They heavily depended on the Force powers to keep themselves alive, which was sort of a crutch and made them terrible tacticians. This assortment of terrible qualities combined together led to a perfect storm of nonsense that was Jedi leadership during the first battle of Geonosis. The Jedi commanders essentially led their men across a completely exposed field with no cover against heavily fortified separatist positions. The casualties were massive for the clone troopers that day, and the experience would shatter nine years of expectations, hopes, and dream for glory on the battlefield. The Battle of Geonosis deeply affected some clones, like the members of Omega Squad, an elite commando unit made up of lone survivors of that battle. Then there were individuals like Cut Quain, who defected from the Republic shortly after the Battle of Geonosis, trading his life of war for a life of peace. And so, even though the first Battle of Geonosis was a victory for the Jedi, it completely shook the faith that clone troopers had in their Jedi leaders. But still, there are almost zero stories like Slicks, where a clone trooper would be so disgruntled by the first battle of Geonosis that he would actually betray his fellow clones. So we find out that Clone Sergeant Slick had cut a deal with Separatist agent Asajj Venturus. He would give Asajj Venturus information about Republic troop movements in exchange for credits. But as Slick mentioned when he was caught, She offered me something more important, something you wouldn't understand. Freedom! 
I actually believe Slick here, but I don't think he really cared all that much about the credits, aside from the fact that the credits would help him achieve his freedom once he's on the run from the Republic. A clone is raised and never needing anything that couldn't be provided to him by the Galactic Republic or the Kaminoans. The cloners had complete control over their childhoods and what they were exposed to. And so these kids weren't bombarded by advertisements or product placements. They didn't look at other clones and see them have better shiny armor or better weapons. Instead, every clone got the same gear, same training, and same food. There was no difference. The value of money was never ingrained in the clone troopers the way it was ingrained in the average citizen in the Republic. And we have to be careful about planting our own needs and desires into these clone troopers when we attempt to understand what motivates them. Because these clone troopers, again, are purposely isolated from the free market and civil society so that they're much easier to control. So what about this idea of freedom? Well, the Kaminoan cloners were very thorough with how they altered the DNA of Jango Fett, and they were very certain on what kind of behavior modifications they wanted to do. For one, these clone troopers were altered to be more docile and loyal and less independent than Jango Fett. They were designed to be better at following orders and have less hyper-aggressive behavior and violent tendencies. These weren't perfect measures, of course, and so layered on top of the DNA modifications were the behavioral modification biochips, which further limited the independence and aggression of the troopers. It was an extremely powerful tool that could even force clones to kill their Jedi commanders during Order 66. Then there was the nurture part of a clone trooper's life, which also was heavily controlled. Different commanders and trainers had different impacts on the young clones they were training, however. In Legend, Jango Fett had actually bought along with him a hundred different bounty hunters and mercenaries who would train the clone commando units. Each trainer had a different cultural background, a different fighting style, and that would really show in how the clone commandos would stand out as individual fighters. The point is, no matter how much you tried to standardize the clone training program, you weren't going to get completely identical individuals. Each clone had a very individual personality, including someone like Slick. But what makes Slick so different from everyone else is all of this conditioning, indoctrination, and propaganda doesn't really seem to work on him. This includes the most powerful and effective control mechanism used by the Grand Army of the Republic, Brotherhood. Because the clone troopers were born in test tubes, they didn't really have any family, and so they all saw each other as family members. It's very important to develop kinship and relationship with families when you're at those important developmental stages, when you're still trying to figure out how to human correctly. And so the clone troopers were all brothers to one another, and that is one of the most unbreakable human connections a person can make. To break such a bond is unthinkable, and that's probably why the clone army works so well, and why the Jedi and the Kaminoans and the Republic were able to control them so well, because at the end of the day, the clone troopers weren't really fighting for the Republic, they were fighting for their brothers. And so when Slick betrays his brothers by giving Asajj Ventress those battle plans, he believes he's doing this for the betterment of all clones. He cares so much about the clone troopers, he's willing to sacrifice a few clones in order to bring down the real threat to the GAR, which is the Jedi leadership. Slick realized pretty early on that the clone troopers were basically born into servitude. They had no choice on what their life was going to be like, and if they tried to leave the GAR, well, that would be considered going AWOL, and that could lead to great punishment and even death. In an isolated environment where everything is controlled, like Kamino, it's a lot harder for the clone troopers to understand the outside world. And so before the Battle of Geonosis, the clone troopers probably weren't aware of the fact that they were slaves. But after going on a few campaigns and seeing how the rest of the galaxy lived and how other people had freedoms and different professions that then involve holding a blaster, well, it probably started dawning on some of these clone troopers that their lot in life was very unfair. To have this kind of insight, Slick has to come to terms with the fact that the first nine years of his life were forced upon him. All the great achievements, all the success he's had in training, all the promotions he's earned from his performance were complete nonsense and in service of a system that enslaved him. I mean, normal human behavior when they find out their entire profession and life is a farce is either to have a mental breakdown or number two, they'll just double down on what they're doing to make sure that this false reality they live in is actually real. I mean, humans don't always do the right thing, they usually do what's comfortable first. Slick is fearless in making the moves that he does. He's willing to throw everything away for this idea of freedom, even if it means betraying his fellow brothers and becoming a criminal. Or at least that's what he says. 
The one trait that Slick has, the one personality market that allows him to betray his fellow brothers, but also at the same time realize that he in fact is a slave, is Slick's sense of self and selflessness. It's actually not a trait we oftentimes see in the clone trooper population. It's something we see a lot in the general human population, but again, thanks to the conditioning, thanks to the genetic alterations, um, it's very rare to see a selfish clone. But there are always going to be outliers, especially in a population as large as the Grand Army of the Republic. If Slick really was trying to start a revolution for the clone troopers that would free them from the yokes of their Jedi oppressors, he most likely would have taken another route that would have exposed the Jedi as fraud or only harmed the Jedi and not his fellow clone brothers. The fact that he blows up the GAR weapons depot, making it significantly harder for the clones to defend their position shows that he's willing to do whatever it takes in order to serve his own interests in escaping the GAR. That or maybe Slick was really stupid and brainwashed into doing what he did by Assange Ventress because it's clearly not a good move on his part. I think it's really a miracle that more clones didn't think like Slick. But then again, when you have complete control over an organization, it's much easier to suppress dangerous ideas, and in this case, dangerous personality traits. Showrunner Dave Filoni said that in this episode, Slick basically goes Django Fett and becomes a bounty hunter willing to do anything for money. Which is why Django volunteers his DNA for this absurd project in the first place. Just as important as the fact that Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jedi Knight Anakin hear Slick's speech about being slaves to the Jedi and are completely unmoved by it. I think, objectively speaking here, Slick has a lot of good points. I mean, he kind of loses the message when he betrays the clone troopers. I mean, that hurts his argument. But what's more worrying is the fact that these Jedi warriors that guard the integrity and moral values of the Republic don't understand why what they're doing is wrong. So that's our breakdown of Sergeant Slick and why he betrays the clone troopers and why so few other clone troopers do something like this. I mean, this is really a testament to the Kaminoan cloners and their terrific cloning program. And look, I hate these aquatic mammals, I really do, but they did an excellent job at basically controlling all of these clones and how they thought and then tying their loyalty to each other to the Republic and the Grand Army of the Republic. It is very brilliant. Let me know in the comment section below what you think about Slick's motivations. And also don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.